Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the pre-sales edition of the 33 CXOs. Today, we welcome Frank Lamprea, Director of Sales Engineering at ThoughtSpot. Frank was a technical champion and a customer of Blade Logic, who was enticed into the pre-sales team of Blade in the mid-2000s. Having made the transition, he has never looked back and gone on to forge a highly successful career in sales engineering leadership. In this episode, we discover how to scale high-performing pre-sales teams that can hugely amplify the output of the sales function. This is his playbook. pre-sales edition of the 33 CXOs, we discover the crucial role that the pre-sales organization played in what is regarded as the greatest success story in the history of software sales. When John McMahon reunited the team at Blade Logic, he had a clear vision to create a sales and pre-sales organization that was in absolute unison. The symbiotic and almost telepathic sales rhythm is the benchmark for best practice. The outcome is not only execution excellence, but a shift to a value mindset which transcends any shift in technology. The pre-sales team now take executive positions at some of the fastest, most disruptive technology companies in the world. What we discover is that John McMahon's vision has not only changed how we sell, it's changed what we sell. Welcome to Hunters and Unicorns, the pre-sales edition of the 33 CXOs. I'm Simon Kutis, and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Harrison. Great to be here. And we are absolutely delighted to welcome Frank Lamprea. Frank, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Simon and Patrick. Really looking forward to the session. Thanks for joining us, Frank. It's fantastic to have you on the show. So, Frank, you're currently Sales Engineering Director at ThoughtSpot in what has been an illustrious career. Most of that time, you've obviously been very loyal to the John McMahon playbook companies along the way. Um, And whilst we are going to talk uh, about your mission at ThoughtSpot, I want you to just take us right to the beginning and your entry point to kind of pre-sales and uh, how you arrived at BladeLogic. Absolutely. So... I did have uh, around 15 years of just pure IT before uh, I entered into pre-sales. And the last place that I was was this company called Wildcard Systems. It was a financial services company. And um, at at that uh, company, I was managing the data center. So I was director of data center operations. And I had a team of uh, engineers, sysadmins, a few developers, et cetera. So it was a a traditional type of IT role. And along that way, we decided that automation was something very important uh, because of the way we were running the business and the applications we were developing. Automating everything was critical. We embarked on a journey to look for for an automation solution, and we came across Blade Logic. So that was my first introduction to that company was actually as a customer. And uh, I befriended the sales team that sold me the, the solution. I was not the economic buyer. I was actually the, the technical champion. Uh, obviously, back then, I didn't know any of these terms. I, I was just buying some software and getting along with, with the sales team, and they were treating me right. Um, <clears throat> but I think they saw something in me. And um, I think over the course of two years that I was their customer, they would sometimes insinuate, hey, you should come work for us. I didn't know anything about pre-sales. It didn't make sense to me at that time. I would just look at my career and think like, why would I want to do that? Uh, I don't know anything about it. Um, But something happened one day. I was just kind of tired of doing that job. I think I had had maybe an argument with my boss. And uh, Chris Anderson, who was the sales rep, still actually a very good friend of mine, uh, called just to check on me 
right? As, as a good rep does, regularly talks to their customers. And you mentioned, hey, my sales engineer uh, went to another company and we're looking for somebody and why can't it be you? And at that moment, I just, something inside of me said, yeah, it should be me. Let's, let's, let's try and do this. Wow. Um, and so the, the rest is history. I interviewed for the position. They like me. I think the fact that I ha- was a customer, I understood the pain intimately. I basically knew everything about who I needed to sell to because that was me. So it was a very natural fit. It was easy. I think half the job I already knew how to do. I just needed to learn some of the mechanics of sales engineering. Uh, and, you know, I started my journey in, into pre-sales uh, at that moment. That was back in 2006. Fantastic. That's, that's really interesting. And um, how, how do you feel having that? that so was it 15 years in an end user prior to Blade Logic or end, the end user market? Yeah, I think since I was a teenager, I've always been into technology and computers. So as, as, as soon as I finished high school, uh, I, I went to college, but it, I was also working uh, at the same time. And I started kind of the traditional grounds up, working desktop support, helping people with their laptops and computers, and then just, just uh, you know, rose the ranks in, in IT. But yeah, it was probably about 15 years of, of doing that. Fantastic. And do you feel that has given you a really different path to most other sales engineers or is it something that has uh, kind of leveled out over time? I think uh, it's rare that you meet a sales engineer that is a, what I call a pure sales engineer. That's the only job they've ever done. A lot of people have been on the other side, if we want to call it that. Mm. But I think it, it did because I still find a lot of connection with my customers because I felt their pain. I did their job. I, you know, had uh, their challenges and it makes it a little bit easier, I think, to understand where they're coming from and to communicate in their terms uh, because I was in that world for such a long time. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting, Frank, because you you have come from, you know, what is a technical discipline, but obviously you understand the proposition. But Blade Logic is obviously known for their incre- the, the power of their sales organization and the rigor of and the process around sales. How difficult was it for you to adapt to that side of the role? So first of all, I'll say I got very lucky because <laughs> it could have been any company that recruited me. Uh, I didn't know anything about what good or bad looked like from a sales organization. Uh, I just trusted my friend, Chris Anderson, who said, come over to this, this company. Um, <clears throat> one thing that made it easy for me is that the, the sales process, and, and I don't know what we call it these days, the John McMahon process, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it had very much of an engineering feel. A lot of times we talk about sales as more of an art, versus a science. I think our process is a little bit closer to science. And as an engineer, it was just, it just felt easy, right? Because it was a little more mechanical. There was steps to it. There was a process, there was rules. There was things you could do, things you couldn't do, ways to do it. Um, And it, it, It was almost like learning another technology, right? You're working that IT job. Your boss says, hey, we just bought this product. Go learn it. It was was a very similar experience. Um, And then you're surrounded by people that are like-minded and and collaborative and and supportive. So I did not, I I can't recall feeling, you know, all that uncomfortable. Uh, And I learned it fairly quickly. You talk about, DNA of the sell of the pre-sales organization as much as the sales guys talk about DNA. Tell us what you mean by DNA. Well, I, it, it's, it's the makeup of the person. I, over time, I think I've come to understand that the, the most successful pre-sales people have an interesting mix of, of skills uh, that makes them who they are, similar to your DNA, right? You get certain genes, you may not get certain genes. I may want to be a top athlete, but if I didn't have certain genetic qualities, it, it probably may never happen. 
Um, and it was, it was the same in pre-sales. There are so many technical people out in the world, but only a handful can be successful pre-sales because you need that mix of technical expertise, but also a good set of soft skills, communication skills, savviness with the business, um, ability to build champions and connect with people. There's a lot of things that I think I even today sometimes take for granted now in pre-sales that are unique qualities. And I guess, you know, later we'll talk about recruiting probably, but uh, those are the things that we look for uh, because it's not easy to find. Not everybody has these, these, I think, opposing skills in some cases. And through, through that transition for our viewers who have maybe recently transitioned into pre-sales from a technical role or, uh, even those in the end user considering a more commercial position. How, how was that transition for you? Was it something that took a little while? Did you ever look back or was it something you really gravitated towards and knew this was for you straight away? Um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it, it was kind of a subconscious transition. Uh, in hindsight, I, now understand why maybe they selected me or had targeted me for recruitment because as I was a customer exhibiting certain behaviors, they already started to see that DNA that they looked for Mm. because in my position in it, I had to build champions inside my organization. I had to convince other people to do things that they maybe didn't want to do. Uh, I had to look for new solutions. I had to manage complex technical projects, AKA similar to a, a POC, right. And in, in pre-sales. So there was a lot of things I was doing that were analogous to the job. I just didn't know it. I was actually selling already inside my organization, but I'd never thought of it that way. Yeah. Um, and so the, the transition was not as hard for me, but it was still, uh, and, and I'll mention I had one little stumble uh, because I think what you miss the most when you do the transition is if you're passionate about technology, which I still am to this day, going from a pure technical job to a pre-sales role, you kind of feel like, oh, I'm not going to be as technical or I'm not going to be as involved with the products and the technology and the hands-on every day. You mm-hmm. still are to a big extent, but not if it was your full-time job. That took a little getting used to. And I still had people back in my old world pulling my strings, uh, trying to get me to come back. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, I think about a year or two into Blade Logic, I kind of made a, a mistake, right? And I, I ended up accepting this offer to go back into IT. And it only lasted about two months. And I realized how stupid of a decision that was. Wow. And luckily, uh, Blade Logic actually took me back, David Achiria. <laughs> which I don't think he does often, he, you know, accepted for me to return. And, and it was kind of like that sin was, was washed away. Um, and that was an important lesson to me because now when I recruit people straight out of kind of the customer side, I have a much better uh, ability to kind of explain to them what, uh, what they're going to be feeling and the obstacles they're going to run into and how to overcome them because I don't want them to go through what I did. Nobody had that pep talk with me to tell me, you're going to feel these things. You're going to miss your old life. You're going to question whether this is the the job for you until you're fully committed to it. Um, And so that was a good lesson for me. Yeah. And was that the, the transition into sales? Was it the commercial pressure that kind of initially made you doubt whether you'd make the right, the right choice? Um. Yeah, honestly, I can't remember all the reasons, but when you think about the pre-sales job, it is quite different. You're, mm. uh, there is a def- definite difference in pressure. And I, I equate it to the old life, you know, success was kind of measured more in the amount of time you were investing in the things you were doing. I remember people would take pride in, oh, I worked, you know, this many hours or I was here all night working on something. And that sort of was how you would measure your, your strength, your, your stature in, in the data center. 
Yeah. And in sales, it's really more about performance. So there's definitely a big flip there. Mm-hmm. And your value system of how you feel, how you determine sort of internally whether you're doing the right job and being successful has to completely be rewritten. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that takes a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's other pressures, right? You're traveling, the lifestyle changes. Uh, I had also, as part of the job, accepted to move to another city. So there was just a massive amount of change. I had left to another state. Uh, the day that we moved, my wife told me uh, she was pregnant with our second child. So all of a sudden, I'm changing careers. I'm moving to another state. We're about to have another kid. I'm on the road all the time. So it was just a lot uh, you know, to deal with in that first year. Hmm. Wow. Did you feel part of the sales organization or did you feel part of the pre-sales organization or, or, or were they kind of intertwined? Yeah, Blade Logic was a great learning ground because we had a tight-knit relationship between the two organizations. It obviously helped that uh, when I joined, they paired me with Chris Anderson, who already knew very well and we were friends. So it was it was my buddy, you know, and I going out to work every day. So that, that part was a lot of fun. Uh, and we were very tight knit, very well synchronized. Um, and we started, you know, eventually had a lot of success and started closing deals and had that chemistry. And it was the same with the other teams. The company was still relatively small. When I joined, you knew everybody, uh, there was no reason to, to have that, that divide. Um, and so again, it was, it was luck on my part that I joined a company that, that had the right system and the right chemistry. And I learned all the right things from the beginning. Uh, and so definitely that partnership between sales and pre-sales was strong there. And and I never felt that we were two different classes of citizen. Actually that the kind of sales partnership is part of your playbook right? It's something that it's a mindset, but also something that you could try to advocate. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the mechanics of that? Mm-hmm. I view the world and, and if you interview enough people in different companies and, and meet different sales engineers and even different places I've been, you, you come to learn that there's two ways that sales engineers are kind of categorized. You're either a tool or you're a partner. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of companies treat sales engineers as a tool. It's, you're a sales engineer. You don't have a strong relationship with sales. You kind of wait for the call, do a demo, do this POC, then go away. And, uh, and some people like to work that way. And that's, that's their prerogative. Um, but I think there's so much value that's lost because the sales engineer can contribute a whole other point of view and a whole other level of experience. Uh, so I've always strived to not have that and actually have it be a partnership of equals um, with some nuances, right? It's, it's very clear to me that the rep always carries the quota and has a lot of risk, right? You, usually SEs aren't directly carrying a quota. They're supporting uh, somebody who's carrying a quota. So there are some nuances that need to be taken into account. But I think a big part of why we would win at a place like Blade Logic and other companies I've been at is that we maximize the value of the resources that we had um, by developing relationships like that, by not letting somebody idle when they could be contributing. Uh, and so using your entire ecosystem at your disposal to win an opportunity, I think is very important. Um, don't try to go at it alone actually use your pre-sales to the maximum unleash them. As I would say, there's a lot of pre-sales and a pre-sales engineer can be doing on their own and they should be developing those champions, rooting through the organization, asking a lot of questions, uh, finding information, bringing back that, that intelligence, uh, things that happen when, you know, the reps not around sometimes, the, the engineers you're working with at a customer will tell you things that they wouldn't tell you if other people were in the room. So I think it's important to have that happen. Uh, and also look at everything else 
in, in your ecosystem. If you have business value consultants, they have a role to play. <clears throat> so my advice is ask yourself that question constantly. What are all the resources at my disposal and how are they deployed on this opportunity? Or do I just have them sitting on the sidelines and I'm missing a piece of value that I could be using to try and win? Why do you think the pre-sales org is, is particularly useful for building champions and identifying pain? <clears throat> I've always believed the deal is a handshake between a technical champion and an economic or business champion inside the, the customer. I reflect back on my own experience. My boss, who was the economic buyer, would always come to me and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this and that. What do you think? And if I said no, the deal wasn't going to happen. Likewise, if I brought him an idea and he said no, it wasn't going to happen. So I quickly learned those two sides of the house have to meet in the middle and agree to for something to happen. Uh, every technical champion always has a boss who's the economic buyer. It's very rare you find one person who's both. And every sort of business champion usually has a right-hand person who's the technical person they always go to for verification and advice. Uh, and then you look at how we construct the sales team. You have the rep and the SE, and it's sort of along the same lines. One is responsible for the business. One is responsible for the technology. We have to win both sides of the house and we have to be coordinated amongst ourselves to make sure that our customer is, is, is going to get that handshake that we're looking for. Mm. And, and how did medic help you? What did, oh, let me, let me ask the question again. What aspects of medic were, do you think you benefited from most to be able to kind of, you know, be successful? Well, in the end, everything, right? Um, I think number one is pain. And I'm probably fast forwarding more in my career to under to over time, you understand the importance of pain. If you haven't mapped out pain and understood exactly the problem you're solving and what it means to the business, you're going to have a tough time winning. Uh, it's easy to get technical excitement in the customer. I could walk into any customer and say, hey, do you want to play with the technology I'm, I'm selling and probably somebody would say, yeah, let's do it. That, that doesn't mean that they're going to buy it. Uh, so I think definitely pain is important. Right. And it was, it, it was important. I think back in the blade logic days and McMahon was very, very adamant about carefully tracking all the points in medic and making sure that every opportunity you were thinking about, all of those points. So it was very hard for you to sort of forget you hadn't found pain. And, uh, and if you hadn't found it and there wasn't any, it was sort of easy to decide I shouldn't be in this opportunity uh, because there's nothing here. Um, then you have metrics and, and, and all kind and you know, you're, you're mapping out your champions and, and uh, the decision criteria that was, that was definitely very important. Because for us in Blade Logic, the decision criteria was was uh, we wouldn't even do a POC until we pretty much knew we were going to win. We would essentially do a, a POC on paper with the economic buyer by presenting a bunch of decision criteria and saying, if we do these ten things on the, on this this piece of paper, are you going to buy? And they said, yeah, as long as it, as you do can do those ten, we have a deal. So the POC was more just an affirmation of all the work we had already done versus an interest generator, which is something you see in a lot of organizations. The, the, the POC might start as actually just something trying to, to create a groundswell and it's not the buying event. Uh, and there's reasons to do that, right? I've been at companies where that's necessary uh, versus the other way around. What we talk about, you're talking a lot about winning deals, right? It's interesting from that question, you could have easily said something like, well, medic really helped me save time. But actually, you've gone for the fact that it helps me win more. How important is winning to you and your team? Uh, 
it's it's uh it's interesting because uh when you look at at a sales engineer it at i think on the surface it doesn't seem like we get as excited about winning and maybe we don't come across as as being as competitive and maybe even as as coin operated as we say in the business uh but deep down inside i think we're all very competitive uh in different ways and it stings when you lose um uh, because you put in so much time and effort, right? Uh, I mean, in, in the end, we're trying to win. We're trying to, to, to get that business to, to, to culminate, you know, uh, successfully that effort. So I'd say SEs love to win, even if they don't show it. Mm. Um, and it, it may be a difficult question to answer, Frank, because, um, I know obviously you moved from end user into, into Blade Logic. Um, how, how forward thinking do you think the Blade Logic pre sales organization was at that time? Do you think we can attribute a lot of the practices today, or w- was it more of a case of running the best practice 101 at that time? Well, we learned a lot along the way. I think uh, back then it was less common to see the things that we were doing. So I'd say we, we were, we were definitely more forward thinking. Mm. Uh, now you sort of this methodology has spread out to so many companies that it's, uh, I think more common to see SEs behaving uh, in sort of this more structured mechanical way uh, aligned around medic with, you know, a tight process and very closely synchronized with their sales reps. That's very common today, but back then, it was part of part of our secret to success. Uh, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times a customer would tell us, you guys are just better at what you do. It was sometimes we would win, I think, not just because our technology was good, because a lot of times our, our, our competitor back then was Opsware and we were kind of neck and neck. Yeah. Uh, so a, a differentiator for us was our people and the way that we engaged and the way that, that we built trust and value with the customer that was almost as important as the product we were selling and our competition wasn't doing a lot of those things Mm. uh, as far as i'm aware uh and so for us it was actually a differentiator back then Mm. so march 2008 obviously acquisition by bmc what was your what was it like for you, um, you know, once you found out that BMC were going to acquire Blade Logic? What was your kind of initial response to that? Probably a little more relaxed than most people. It, in my IT career, I had been in places that had been acquired a couple of times. I think I had been through two large acquisitions. So I already knew what to expect, and I knew that it wasn't as – that your mind would build a much larger construct of all the bad things that it was going to be versus what, what reality would be. Um, if we fast forward through that, it actually ended up being great for us. I think most of us at Blade Logic probably made, you know, the most income due to that acquisition in those first kind of six or 12 months after. So it, it ended up being a positive for us. Uh, and then career wise, I think we all benefited because, um, <clears throat> I think BMC didn't just acquire Blade Logic for the technology. I think they were also interested in our methodology and in our people. And they wanted that to bleed into the rest of their organization uh, and make them, their entire company, uh, I think, optimized around the way that, that we were doing such a unique sales methodology at Blade Logic. And that's, in fact, what ended up happening. So through that, all of us became leaders and grew our careers because it gave us the opportunity to, to grow and then teach and expand that in a much larger company. Hmm. So you've gone from pre-sales manager kind of entry, then September, 2010, you became director of pre-sales and you're managing a team of eight managers and 65 SE. So this is quite a substantial org that you're responsible for. So how did you find the transition from IC to leadership to kind of more senior leadership? Mm -hmm. So I had been a leader in, in, in IT before on a much smaller scale. I didn't have, you know, 75 
people uh, in my organization. I had maybe maybe 20 at most. Um, so moving to first line management was was easier for me um, because I had been there. Um, <clears throat> and having been an individual contributor with some management skills, moving into first line felt natural. I knew how to you know, manage teams, but I had also done the job so I could coach people. Uh, and to me, I, I felt that that was kind of easy. Um, <clears throat> I was lucky though for the second line move that in BMC, I found a great mentor, uh, Andy Harwood. And I think, you know, uh, just, just how John McMahon has been kind of pivotal for, for several in the sales organization. I think Andy was very important for several in the, in the pre-sales organization. Uh, he was extremely experienced. He's since, has since retired, but extremely experienced. And he just had a way that, that uh, he created a very tight knit leadership team and then coached each of us individually through whatever it took uh, and made sure to challenge us. So you know, my first forays into sec second line management became were more as special assignments with the prospect of maybe getting a promotion. Uh, so he allowed me to fail and and dip my toe in the water with with bigger and bigger challenges until ultimately it kind of became a, a, a full role. Mm. So how, so how was the transition from from a technical perspective from moving from a a startup with a, a specific solution, often competing against Opsware, to now, I guess, um, selling across this wider solution and, and coaching people on how to sell that wider solution? Yeah. Um, it was, I'd say, a slow indoctrination into that world because uh, the first uh, period of time, they allowed us just to stay specialized in our solution. But over time, it became a little more important to learn more and more things. Um, and I'm grateful for that because that, that additional complexity, I just learned a lot. That, that was where Andy's guidance and mentoring came into play because he had already a lot of experience managing large teams across multiple product portfolios. So he, he would run a lot of leadership workshops. And, and through that, we kind of learned how do you manage a big organization of just separate people from different disciplines trying to sell different products and uh, in, in some, you know, sense of market texture, right? We were selling a vision that the technology wasn't quite there yet. So we had to be ahead of where the product was um, versus leading with the product, if that makes sense. Mm. <clears throat> so another element within your playbook is building a culture of change, so could you just tell us a little bit about that and how that ties into what you've kind of just shared with us? Yeah, that's critical. Uh, uh, if you're going to remain successful, you need to constantly be thinking about adapting and changing. It's, it's just, it's just a given. Uh, even if you're winning all the time, you should expect that eventually that's going to stop and you need to be thinking about uh, what's happening next. And for that to be successful, in other words, to build that culture of change, you need to make sure that everybody in your organization is very uh, comfortable with change. And so it's everything from how you're constantly communicating with people, even in the recruiting process, looking for people that, that are more comfortable with change. Um, and, and, and basically just setting that expectation that don't ever get too comfortable with, with how we're doing things, how our team is structured. Um, even, you know, the, the direction of our product, it could be any of the elements that, that you're doing today, expect them to change and always look at that from the bright side. Uh, change is, is not a bad thing. It's not, you should actually be more worried if change isn't happening uh, because that means you're not getting ready for the challenges that are coming. Does that also tie into mastery as well? Or do you see that as kind of separate? <clears throat> yeah, I think I talk about sharpen the sword. <clears throat> and so it's the same. You, it, if you think that your skills are at the top and you don't need to practice anymore, that you don't need to change anymore, eventually you'll, you'll be overtaken and you'll fail. 
Um, and, and so it's the same with, with your, with your self-discipline. You should always be looking at what can I do better? What can I change? What do I need to learn that I don't know yet? Um, push the envelope of yourself and constantly be trying to improve and change yourself. Uh, but also expect the organization to be doing something similar at a grander scale. Hmm. So um, in terms of building a team, what is it that you are trying to instill within your team? I, I know you just touched on a few more, but kind of take us through that. Your, kind of your mindset, your process of building high, high performance pre-sales teams? Yeah, it begins with recruiting for sure. <clears throat> I always feel that's one as, as a uh, sales engineering leader, potentially the most important decisions you ever make are who you recruit. Um, because, uh, and I'm not going to say I haven't made mistakes and, and sometimes not recruited the correct people. Um, but it all begins there. How are you going to pick the people? Right. And it can change every company I've been to the type of person and the skill set might vary. Even today at ThoughtSpot there, you know, maybe there is a bunch of people that I would love to bring over here, but I know they're not the right fit. Uh, so that's number one is, is, is recruiting is critical. You really need to sit down and understand what's the right person for the place that you're at what's the skill set both technical and sales what's the sales model that 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 is being used um and how can you find people that fit into that um and then um then sorry remind me the the, the question so it's just with regards to how you build high performing team so you've obviously mm -hmm. touched on recruitment as one of them uh, as kind of the one of the, the core but you talk about higher right. Yeah, that's, that's obviously one of your yeah. kind of key pillars, right? Higher right. So just tell us a yeah. little bit more about that. Yeah, so higher right. <clears throat> Number two is really have a plan for once they get into the organization. Uh, it's not enough just to hire and expect that they're going to figure it out themselves. I think the most successful teams I've been on are the ones that have uh, a strong boot camp right? To indoctrinate that person, get them productive as quickly as possible. Uh, and, and that's important. So spend time building a good enablement practice. Uh, because as we talked about a little while ago, sharpening that sword, uh, <clears throat> the more you can make that easier for the individuals on your team, the better. Um, they'll invest the time to get better and, and, and to be higher performing but it can be very time consuming. And the more that you can sort of relieve that consumption of time by giving them things that you've already prepared, uh, the better. So go ahead. No, no, please. Sorry, Karen. Yeah. So things like, and, and it's not just product training. I think soft skill training is very, very important. Uh, at BMC, we, I think we did a very good job of, of uh, constantly making people sharpen the sword from a soft skill perspective. There was just mounds of role playing that we would do, simulating meetings, simulating yourself on the whiteboard, simulating objection handling, uh, simulating a demo gone bad, uh, uh, practicing uh, presentation skills, how you carry yourself, how you address the audience. It was we probably spent more time on soft skill development than we actually did on, on, on the product. And that was particularly important for pre-sales because I think uh, many organizations don't invest in pre-sales enablement uh, for their pre-sales team. They tend to just focus on teaching them about the technology and the products and not how to be better speakers, better presenters, how to build better champions. Uh, how to, you know, ask better questions, how to find pain, all those, those things that are so important, it kind of get overlooked. Mm. 
Yeah, it, it, you made an interesting point that at ThoughtSpot right now, there are people you want to bring in, but you don't think that they're perhaps right. Can you just tell us a little bit about why is that? Is that the maturity of the business? Is it a DNA thing? Well, what is it that, wh- where is the misalignment and why do you need different people at different stages for, for different businesses? <clears throat> Yeah, so it can be sometimes the maturity of the business. Uh, ThoughtSpot is younger than some of the other companies I've been to. Um, and so sometimes you do need to look at what does an individual I want to bring in need to be successful. I'll, when I'm interviewing somebody, I always like to probe, for example, how they, what are their expectations around enablement? And you'll find sometimes people will say, oh, I'm expecting you to have sort of a full university system ready for me. And others will say, hey, I will grind it out. If you have nothing, I will figure out how to learn everything. And so you sort of need to look at what do I have in place now versus how that per- what that person needs to be successful. So that's, that's number one. Number two is also the market that we're selling to and the audience. Uh, ThoughtSpot tends to be more driven towards selling to the business and, and a little less to the, the technology. So in this case, I probably need people that, are, that have much stronger uh, soft skills because they're going to be exercising that a lot more here than the product side. I'm not going to say that, that you know, there's no, no technical requirements here, but it's not as deep technically as a Blade Logic would have been or an App Dynamics, which was just way down in the depths of, of, of IT. And that was what, what was really needed for those companies to be successful. Um, so I think it's, you know, a 360, look at everything, um, not only what you're selling and who you need to sell to, but also what you have in place as a, as, as a structure in the organization and try to map out what the success paths for that individual is and find those gaps. And then you'll have your, your decision there. You'll know whether you think a person can be successful or not. Mm. Fantastic. And just to take things back slightly chronologically, Frank. So um, after, I think, five and a half years, roughly after the acquisition, you built um, a, a large pre-sales org of about 70 heads around eight second line managers. Um, talk us through your decision to, to move on at that point in, in late 2013. Yeah. Um, obviously, things that changed a lot. Um, and you know, for better or for worse, BMC was headed in a direction that wasn't compatible with, with uh, what I wanted to see. Um, I also mentioned I had a deep passion for technology. And mm. personally, one of the hard things for me when I get to second line or even higher is you start getting more distant from the technology and the job becomes a little bit more about, about the people and, and a little bit more about the administration of an organization. And that's probably, uh, I'd say, maybe less exciting for me. Um, and so <clears throat> I, if you look at my career, I kind of go like this, right? It's sort of like I'm riding a wave. So I, I get yeah. to the crest and then I, I want to get down and ride another wave up. Mm. Um, and clearly, a lot of people I knew and worked with had moved over to, to App Dynamics. Um, and once, once I... I saw the product and, and, and understood what they were in. It felt like a, like a good place to go. And, and I have three criteria. A lot of people always ask me, why did you pick this company or why did you pick that company? And I look at three things uh, and I look at them in this order. I look at number one, the people who's there and what is their skill set, And do I believe that that collection of people has what it takes to make a company successful? And I saw that in App Dynamics, mm. uh, the decisions they had made, where they were at, uh, et cetera. What I heard through my interviews. Number two is the market. Um, what are what are you selling into? And if you look at a CIO's top ten list of where they're planning to spend their money, where would you rank on that list? And App Dynamics was nearly at the top, and I had never, you know, maybe. I don't even think Blade Logic had ranked that high. So that was interesting for me uh, because, it, you know, it was, 
it, it was a hot item. Uh, and then, t- interestingly enough, most people would probably look at the product first and pre-sales. I look at that last because I've learned that even if you have the best product, if it's at a company run by the wrong people or in a market that is, you know, not on the CIO's, you know, top 10 list, mm. you're probably not going to be able to sell that product very easily. So I actually look at that last. I look at the other two pieces first. And yeah. then the last thing was, let me look at this product. Is it actually a good product? And was it well, well built? Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. And Obviously, App Dynamics had an incredible period of growth. What, what kind of size was it when you joined, and um, was it a similar kind of growth trajectory to Blade Logic? A similar culture? Yeah, it it it, it was kind of like Blade Logic on steroids. When I joined Blade Logic, I think I was probably around an employee a hundred, and when we got acquired, we were maybe in the three hundreds, maybe four hundreds. When I joined App Dynamics, I believe I was employee 400. Uh, and by the time I left, we were 2,500. So yeah, it was, you know, a, a spectacular rise uh, and a growth, you know, much larger than anything I had seen. I, I still remember to this uh, day, you know, there was one point at, at App Dynamics where, you know, we got this call and said, hey, we're going to grow the company. And they told me you need to hire like 15 sales engineers, like in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> and uh, I was like, Oh my God, am I going to do that? It got to the point where we were running, we had a forecast call for hiring because we needed to hire so much, so many people. We were running our recruiting pipeline, like reps were running their opportunities. Wow. We had commits, we had, a forecast every week we had to, you know, get up there and explain where are we in our recruiting pipeline? When are you going to kind of land this, this candidate? When are you going to land this other candidate? Mm -hmm. Uh, But it was very effective because it gave us that discipline uh, to make sure we made that our number one priority uh, to bring those people in. Mm. Was was it Dali Rajik? Um, Was Dali Rajik CRO at that time or was that kind of pre when, when, when you joined yeah that was right right i think when he started taking over um that we did that big burst Mm -hmm. and 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 was he the driving force there in terms of kind of the leadership that was really driving that culture because obviously app dynamics a great success story akin to blade logic driving this playbook that we're talking about but who who were the ones that were really beating the drum and and how yeah, who were the ones that were beating the drum in that organization? Yeah, it was definitely Dolly and Jeremy Duggan mm-hmm. uh, for for Europe. Um, <clears throat> there was some sales leadership uh, there before, and to some extent, they had embraced uh, the methodology, but not with as much fervor. Uh, once once Dolly became CRO, it was you know like any other remaining barrier to going all in, uh, was gone. Um, and so, yeah, definitely he was, you know, he was the one that, that fully implemented it at scale, uh, and really with accountability. Cause I'll say one key point of this, of, of, of this sales motion is, is accountability, which is, you know, if you have to do what you promise, right. Do what you say, say what you do. And if, if you can't, then you know what the consequences are. Uh, and that's very important because that's how you keep that high performance engine going is you need to be able to make the hard decisions, uh, even if that means, you know, somebody can't be with the organization. Mm. And Yeah. In, in terms of um, obviously uh, hearing app dynamics described as, as blade logic on steroids is, uh, is fascinating. Was it a lot of the Blade Logic methodologies being built on, or was it kind of putting in place those existing methodologies, or was the real innovation taking place there as well? I think every every company I've been to has has evolved it, uh, mm. and the market's gotten more complex. Right, what we took for yeah. granted back in Blade Logic, a lot of our competition now knows, and have tried to, in some cases, implement some of the things we do. Yeah. Uh, and also the buyers have gotten more savvy, 
right? I, I truly believe customers are smarter about how they acquire solutions now mm. and, and there's more diligence. Uh, so de definitely it, it, it was an evolution and a maturity uh, and some, you know, for a lot of reasons that I can't even explain, like some things work in some companies and, and not in others could be because of the product or the market or who you're selling to. Um, some places need a business case. Other places don't need a business case, mm. right? Some places you can easily capture metrics uh, as part of your medic to met, to measure your impact in other places. It's a little more difficult. Um, like a thought spot, for example, I'd say that uh, our solution is not as metric driven. It's, it's not as measurable as something like blade logic was. So you really, you know, are going to have to adapt. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, just to go back to your point on the, um, the, the metrics that you use to, to scale the, the SE organization for, for our viewers who are, you know, maybe within high growth pre-sales management roles or, um, you know, just in, in pre-sales management positions in general, how, how did you approach that? Is it all about pipeline for you or is it all about, um, uh, were you hiring from end users to keep up with that uh, demand, for example, was there specific methodologies you used? Yeah, that's a good point. When a company's young, it's uh, recruiting is probably a li little easier, especially if you're in a market where that maybe already existed. Yeah. Because you can usually find other people that were already in the space. Uh, but once you scale a company, that's where it really gets challenging because you're going to run out of, of those people in the market mm -hmm. and you're going to have to be able to build new people. Uh, and, and I think that's the inflection point. That was something that, that we kind of mastered at BMC and that I, I brought to app dynamics and, and now at ThoughtSpot is, is how do you, how do you take somebody who has raw talent, but maybe knows nothing about your space or your product, uh, and build a program to teach them. So we talked about enablement, you know, several minutes back. That is why that is so critical because if you're going to scale the business, eventually you will not find people who are experts already in, in what you're doing. You need to build them into those experts. Yeah. And the longer you, you wait to build that program, you'll get bit. And, and I mentioned that, that, that quarter we had at app dynamics of that high growth, we made that mistake there where we didn't have that program. So we were onboarding all these people and we weren't good enough yet at turning them into experts quickly. And, and we paid, you know, a little bit of a price for that. Mm. Uh, but again, that was a lesson I took that start that process early, build that program early and have it before you realize you need it. Yeah. So understanding how quickly we can get a talented individual up to speed in order to be able to scale for the future. Yeah. And, and by raw talent, I mean that they have that natural selling ability. They have champion ability. They have technical expertise, but it could be nowhere in your space. Mm -hmm. A good example is app dynamics and ThoughtSpot are two completely different spaces. So if I was going to bring somebody from my old world in here, they don't, they wouldn't know anything about BI and analytics versus uh, APM. And uh, I'd have to have a way to, to quickly get them up to speed and productive. Mm. It's probably a good time to talk about your transition to ThoughtSpot, right? Um, because obviously that was kind of the next step. But what are the steps that you go through personally in preparation for a new role? Um. <clears throat> So I think, you know, once, once I've made the decision that it, it, it's time to move on, um, I'd say first is a lot of research. Uh, I'm always a fan of saying run towards something, not run from something. Uh, and I've, you know, tried to stay true to that creed, which is even though I've decided I'm ready to leave an organization, I don't want to just take the first thing that comes along. I really want to make sure I've, I, I understand what, what I want to do next so that I have longevity. Um, 
you look at my career, I've roughly, you know, usually been about six years in, in each place. Don't know why six is my magic number, but, uh, but it is. So thought spot, if you're watching, you still have me for a long time. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but number one is that research. Uh, number two is start your preparation for the once maybe you're interviewing or you accept the job, start that preparation even before day one. So coming over to, to, to ThoughtSpot, I didn't know anything about this space. I, I was, you know, I've been telling you guys about recruiting people that are from a different space. That was me coming to ThoughtSpot. I did, had never done, you know, this, this space or, or this product. I, didn't, I knew literally nothing about it. So to even not fail the interview, I had to do quite a bit of preparation and studying and learning, which meant, you know, I had to, on my own time with my own drive had to put myself through some Udemy courses and, and read and I bought books. Uh, so, you know, if you want to be really good at your craft, take it seriously. And it means you've got to put, put that time in to get yourself ready for that next, that next role. And that begins before day one. Hmm. And what's the mission at thought spot? The, the current mission for me. Yeah. What's, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, so it, it's interesting, right? I joined and nobody was expecting COVID. So uh, <laughs> I think that the mission has, has changed significantly. Uh, it's been more, much more challenging than, than I had initially envisioned in different ways. Uh, I remember coming in here and I was mentally prepped for, I'm going to have a big, region and I'm going to have to travel a lot. Right. So I, I remember I had myself psyched for, I'm going to be on the road all the time. I had my family ready for that. I've not been on the road a single day, <clears throat> uh, but we've had other, other challenges, right? <clears throat> like, you know, how do you work in this environment? How does it impact the business? How do you change how you sell? Um, and so I think, you know, we had a short mission, which was get the company through this craziness uh, and emerge successful on the other side. And I think, you know, at this point that, that piece of the mission is concluding. We've, you know, navigated those waters, had to make all the different and difficult decisions, whatever they may be to get us to where we are today. Uh, transforming the business in, in a lot of ways. It's actually been probably the most amount of transformation in the shortest amount of time that I've ever had in my career and stack on that probably some of the more difficult decisions around recruiting and people and, and, um, and just different differences of expectations, right? You have a lot of people who joined the company and were expecting things to go one way and, and now they're going a different way. <clears throat> so I'm glad that I'm here at this point in my career because I can, I can rely on all my experience because it, it probably has been the tallest set of, of challenges. The new mission will be, I think, kind of more classic as, as the world starts emerging from this, I fully expect, you know, we'll need to scale the business and I'll, I'll return a little bit more to the, the, the classic playbook. Yeah. I know that you're obviously quite big on diversity as well, right, Frank? It's one of the topics we spoke about when we, um, when we've spoken in the past. Um, why, why do you think pre-sales has failed historically to kind of, bring in more diversity and, and and is there opportunities in organizations like ThoughtSpot to kind of address that as far as your 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 mission's concerned yeah i think you know first off is just pure numbers the the difficulty of the fact that you know let's say if we look at women and, and technology uh you know historically there was less women in in technical careers or, or technical uh uh, tracks in universities, for example. Uh, and so the, the talent pool um, is smaller. And then uh, if, if you don't have a diversity focus in how you're recruiting, right, you're going to get 10 more male resumes versus, versus one female potentially. So I think you need to start thinking about that in terms of how do you help, you know, the smaller uh, pools or, uh, of, of talent that are there, how do you kind of elevate them a little more so they're more 
in line with, you know, this larger pool that's, that's uh, full of candidates. So I think that's number one is design your, your recruiting with diversity in mind and spend a little more time looking at, uh, you know, uh, minorities or, or the areas where you want to incorporate diversity uh, because it's going to be harder to find candidates there. Uh, but realize that diversity will bring value to your organization because it will, we talked about change and about infusing, you know, new thinking uh, into an organization. You gain that through diversity. If you bring people in that have a different mentality, it will help you because you will do things that you never did before. And you will learn things that you otherwise wouldn't have learned. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, in terms of your kind of continued tr- um, trajectory, what do you think has helped you most continue to kind of scale um, and you know reach the levels that you are reaching at the moment in your career? Definitely, people. I think uh, I couldn't be here without other people supporting me. I've I've always had somebody there that was, you know, um, not going to say necessarily my friend, but a mentor, somebody who took an an interest in investing in me. And I, in turn, have tried to do that with people on my teams and invest in them and and try to make other people successful. Uh, So definitely number one is, is, is you, you need to have a mentor. Um, it will be very hard to do it alone. Uh, so, so seek that mentor. Number two, I think is just discipline. I think that's important is, is um, especially in a, in a model like this where things are more scientific and are measured, you really have to have discipline because you, you can't hide. Uh, personally, I like that. I just like not having that weight of, oh, I haven't done a good job or I'm not doing something on me and trying to hide from your boss, right? So it's easier just be transparent, have the discipline and just do what you have to do uh, and, and bring that every day, have a plan. You know, every day wake up and know what do I need to accomplish today and get it done. Uh, and I think if, if, you, if you live every day like that, you will achieve the goals um, that you're looking for. So setting goals and being very disciplined about how you achieve what you set out to achieve. Yeah. Uh, And it's even, you know, uh, a lot of times when I'd mentor other people, if they wanted to be promoted, I I would tell them you need a plan. And it's almost like having a second job. Don't expect that magically all this time is going to appear for you to invest in this goal. You have to make the time happen, even if that's your own personal time. If you really want something, Mm. You have to have a plan. How am I going to do all the things the organization expects of me? Mm. How am I going to do all these things I need to improve myself so I can get to that next level or that next role or whatever it is that I want? Yeah. Um, but if you, if, if you don't have a plan and you're not thinking about it, you'll never get there. Yeah. I think that's brilliant advice. And hearing you talk about your career and also the people you've worked with, Frank, it seems there's a common trait of um, obviously high standards, but real continuous learning and development and, and really pushing those standards. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, as painful as it can be. And, and I mean, I'm sometimes, you know, uh, mentors or bosses or managers will challenge me and inside you're like, Oh man, really? I have to do that. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Sometimes, you know, here at ThoughtSpot or in other organizations, we may decide to do demo challenges where we have people just demo to each other and everybody hates it because it's uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, Or we may have presentation skills where you have to get up and present in front of a a bunch of people. Everybody hates it because it's uncomfortable. Uh, But everybody will agree in the end that it makes them better. So even though it's something hard and uncomfortable, it makes you better. The easy thing would be not to do it. Um, the hard thing is doing it and the results prove that as, as I, I kind of reiterate what, what I mentioned before, I know that this works when customers tell me on a regular basis that our people made the difference. Um, and, and I firmly believe that a lot of the business we win is because of the people, not because of the product. Mm. The product is important 
but the customer has many choices in the market. And I think that differentiators the people. How do we treat them? How do they feel that we would support them? Uh, and if we have that, that, that discipline and that, you know, strive for perfection, uh, and, and, you know, that, that desire to achieve goals and to make them successful, you know, I think they feel well represented and they, they want us, um, to provide that solution versus somebody else who maybe doesn't have that. Mm. Mm. So I suppose as kind of general closing advice, is there any other advice that you would give to any of our listeners today, um, you know, that, that you think would be worthwhile for them to kind of take, take, take away from today's um, session? Don't make this the last session that you watch. Always keep learning. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of advice I could give people, but, the best one is don't ever stop trying to get better. Uh, sharpen the sword, right? I go back to that is yeah. you look at everything that's successful in the world. Um, you look at uh, uh, like I watched the Michael Jordan, I think Netflix series. And it's, it's a great example of if, if you want to be on the top of your game, it takes a lot of work and you, you have to constantly be working at it and trying to get better. It's the same in our careers. And, enjoy that and make time for it. Make sure that that's part of your day is to watch a podcast like this, um, read a lot, uh, uh, get a lot of newsletters from in the biz, right? Network with a lot of people, uh, make absorbing knowledge, something exciting and something that you want to do every day because every day you'll just bring that one new thing that you didn't know, before uh that will make you better and that will just help you a little make things just a little bit easier great advice fantastic advice and and do take that advice <laughs> so um i suppose the very final question that we ask as part of the pre-sale series is um what technology or area of innovation do you think is going to have the biggest impact on business over the next 10 years just just in your opinion well, I guess, you know, it's probably telling that I'm at a place like ThoughtSpot. I think, think uh, data, machine learning, and, a and AI uh, uh, is, is definitely a place to be right now um, <clears throat> because we understand the world through data, uh, and there's so much of it now. I think there's a lot of uh, value that's pent up and, and hasn't been unlocked. You look at the Snowflake IPO, that was, you know, I think a great example of the market validating that uh that this this is a space that's that's nascent uh so i definitely you know i definitely think that anything around machine analysis of data has a big future you look at self-driving it's all based on that uh you know a, a, any any type of autonomous uh type of machine needs that um i haven't even begun to scratch the surface on it um but it's, it's permeating everywhere. So keep an eye out for that. Great. Fantastic. So I think this would probably be a good time for us to conclude on what we've heard today. And it certainly has been a, a truly fascinating um, session with you, Frank. Um, but in the way of a kind of a, a summary of what we've heard, I, I suppose what I've taken most from today is the 33 CXOs is obviously about leaders that have gone on to achieve statistically impossible feats, incredible um, achievements. And we talk a lot about the DNA of those sales individuals that have gone on to achieve those amazing things. But I think what's, what's evident in what we've heard today is that the, the reason why someone like yourself um, has, a, has, a, has an equal seat alongside these great people is because when you turned up as raw material, you didn't just want to be a tool. You wanted to be a partner. And in order for you to partner, you had to continue to reinvent yourself. And to reinvent yourself, you had to continue to sharpen that saw, really go out there and learn and acquire and evolve. At no point did you get stuck or obsessed with a certain thought process or attached to a specific technology. It was always about understanding the bigger picture and that thirst and that desire for winning um, and to really keep yourself 
at the forefront has enabled you to continue your trajectory. And that's the reason why the 33 CXO in the first series will never outgrow the pre-sales organization. In fact, they are as dependent today as they ever were. So I just want to finish on that note and just say a really big thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been truly fascinating. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I hope we can do it again sometime. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much, Frank. And next time we'll, uh, we might have to have a demo of the 3D printer as well. I'll be ready. I still, <laughs> I still owe you the Hunters and Unicorns logo. So absolutely. I do that. We look forward absolutely, to that. Absolutely. So for our listeners today, we hope that you've enjoyed what you've heard and what you've seen. If you have enjoyed it, please do subscribe. There's lots and lots of content on our website. So please do check out so much soap.com forward slash blog and please do get in touch. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and speaking to you all soon.